Welcome to this video. My name is Phil and I am a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln, which is in England. And I wanted to use this video to have a quick look at a specific type of planet. They're quite rare, actually. There's not many of these actually found. And these are called super puff planets, and they're quite unusual. Or that's even if they're if they're real, they might not actually be real. It might be in the way we're measuring their radius and their mass. So what are they? Well, they're a type of sub-Neptunian planet. And sub-Neptunian planets are between the mass of Earth and the mass of Neptune, which is about 17 times the mass of Earth. So these planets sit in this kind of gap between Earth size or Earth mass planets and Neptune mass planets. Now, most sub-Neptunian planets have a radius between Earth and Neptune, which is between one and four times the radius of the Earth. And I say most because actually they don't all have a radius between that range, actually. And that's where super puffs come in. Because they do have a lower mass, their mass sits in the range that will classify them as a sub-Neptunian. They're not more massive than a Neptune planet, but they are more massive than Earth. But they do have a considerably larger radius than that of Neptune. In fact, they can almost be gas giant in size. They can be up to the size of Jupiter, but they have considerably lower mass. So these are really puffed up planets, or at least they appear to be really puffed up planets. Low mass, probably low density, but quite large size. Now, gas giants already have quite low densities. So, for example, Saturn has a density which is less than water, which for a planet and a planet this size is actually quite low. So a gas giant is already quite low density. So what does that actually make these super puffs? Well, it makes them stand out on their own, basically. So this is a system of super puff planets, which is Kepler 51, B, C and D. There's their size comparison to Earth, Neptune, Uranus, Saturn and Jupiter. And you can see they're pretty much gas giant size, really, but their masses are quite low. So on this plot here, where you've got planet mass in Earth masses along the bottom, you then got the planet radius in Earth radius along the top. And you can see that actually these stand out in a little group on their own. You've got a line there for rocks. That would be the where a rocky planet would be if you increase the mass. Then its radius would be this, approximate to that. Same again for the, a line, the line above that, which is a hydrogen helium kind of planet or atmosphere envelope. And that's where your gas giants are going to be. Now, Neptune and Uranus kind of sit between the two because they have a higher quantity or higher percentage of non-hydrogen than the gas giants, basically. Gas giants are quite considerably... Um, composed of hydrogen. So these super puffs sit in the upper left there because they have large radiuses but low masses. And you can see they don't fit the groups that we know. And these are all measurements that have been taken basically. So this isn't just a model, these are measurements that are calculated and plotted. So what does that actually give the density of these planets? Well, interestingly, if it's correct and the radius and mass has been measured correctly, it means their density is like cotton candy or candy floss. That's incredibly low density for a planet. So is it going to be real, really, is the, is the big question, I suppose. Well, it might not be real. It could be an artifact of how we're measuring them. So a ringed planet like Saturn, if it passes in front of its star, it will block out more light than its mass would suggest. So the, the, a ring system around the planet, again, blocks out more light as it passes in front, but it doesn't necessarily have a larger mass. So these have been detected or at least measured with the transit method. We can't get the radius of a planet really without using this method. We get the mass from the radial velocity method and the radius we get from the transit method. So here, when a planet passes in front of the star, it blocks out some of the light, and it's just a simple ratio, really, of the area of the star, so it's a circle, it's almost thereabouts, emitting light. You then block out some of that light with another circle, and it's a ratio of the two areas, essentially. The bigger the circle that the planet is, blocks out more light. So that's how we can then get the radius. We can calculate what the area was and work back towards the radius. Now, if you've got a ringed planet, Again, I'm just going to use Saturn because it's a pretty good example. If it's an optically thick ring, so that doesn't allow light to pass through, or at least it massively reduces down the amount of light, then as it passes in front of the star, 
it will block out more light, which is obvious really. But then when we do our calculations to calculate the radius of that planet, we're going to get an incorrect answer because we're going to measure the extent to where the ring system goes. And that's not going to be real. Now, a ring like Saturn's has quite little mass, actually. It doesn't have a lot of mass. Maybe it's on the order of one of the small moons of Saturn. But in comparison to a planet, it's going to be very, very, very low mass. It's also very thin, actually. So it's not like a big three-dimensional sphere like the planet would be. But it has a very large radius. So this can then create an illusion of having a very low density because you've measured the radius incorrectly because of the way we've actually detected the, the, well, the, the light that's been blocked out gives us this false measurement, essentially. But it could be that that just explains some of them and the rest of them actually are super puffs. And it could be that some of these are quite close to their star. Their atmospheres are quite puffed up and they are then leaking into space as well. And because these don't have the mass of like a Jupiter-sized planet or Saturn, they don't have that gravitational force to prevent their atmospheres, the outer layers, from leaking into space. So these super puffs actually will evaporate into space over a relatively short period of time. And it could be why, when we are looking for planets, these super puffs are very rare and they're also very young. So there's a common theme really with these planets and they're, they're, well, they're rare, but the ones we have found are young. So it could suggest that we've captured them at the beginning of their evolutionary phase and over time, they will then lose their atmospheres and they will end up possibly like a super Earth or a terrestrial planet once they've lost all of their, their atmosphere, essentially. So it could be that we've captured this before they've transitioned into another type of planet. But thank you for watching. And if you enjoy, then check out some of the other videos.